Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast, where we go deep on the sport of gravel cycling through in-depth interviews with product designers, event organizers, and athletes who are pioneering the sport. I'm your host, Craig Dalton, a lifelong cyclist who discovered gravel cycling back in 2016 and made all the mistakes you don't need to make. I approach each episode as a beginner to unlock all the knowledge you need to become a great gravel cyclist. I'm going to be joined momentarily by my co-host, Randall Jacobs, for another episode of In the Dirt. Randall, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Craig. Good to see you, bud. Yeah, great to see you too. I mean, I've been looking forward to this, just a, a little bit of reprieve from everything else that's going on in life. It's just nice to connect with you and just purely have a half hour, an hour conversation about bikes. Yeah. Yeah, I know you've been going, had a lot going on with your mom and so on. So, you know, definitely sending a lot of love and good vibes to you and your family going through some challenging times. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's a conversation we've had on the podcast and certainly within the ridership community, just about the value of this pursuit of gravel cycling and just kind of getting out of your head. I, I've always loved it in that, like when you're on a, a gravel trail, particularly a technical gravel trail, like I ride, you can't really think about anything else but what's in front of you. And it's just so, so helpful for me to just sort of think about the bike and performance and riding rather than thinking about everything else going on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can relate. I've been processing some heavy things in my own life these days. And at the same time, returning to the bike, I've been doing a lot more walking, hiking, trail running lately, as well as like canoeing and kayaking. The canoe is great with the kids, but there's, there's that flow state that you can get into on the bicycle that is, you know, people talk about runner's high. I've never really had that. I don't think I can run long enough to get to that headspace. But on the bicycle, there's just a place where everything is just in sync. And the it's I just feel very connected to everything, but not overwhelmed by it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was up in Lake Tahoe last weekend and did a bunch of stand-up paddle boarding. I got some good recommendations from people in the ridership as to where I should explore to ride. And I had a bike, but honestly, I just left it on the patio because I was just enjoying the lake so much. And to your point, like with stand-up paddle boarding, I found, you know, I just have to focus on the balance piece. So I, I it sort of took me to that same place. I just got in the rhythm of stroking on either side of the stand-up paddle board and, and being focused on the physicality of it and, and the moment that I was experiencing, which, which I also really enjoyed. Yeah. Stand up paddle boards are great. I actually like them. I use them occasionally standing up, but having them as like a, your own little floating Island in the middle of a lake or a pond, you know, you can have two adults. I've had, you know, another adult and a, a toddler on one. And so one adult is in the water swimming and the toddler is kind of jumping on and off and, and uh, it's, it's just so much fun. fun. Yeah. But you've got so. you've got something coming up that's kind of probably forcing you a little bit to get up back on the bike, right? Well, so well, one, I'm wanting to start coordinating more group rides. I've talked about this quite a bit, and just life has gotten in the way. You know, the logos launch and some things in in my personal life and so on. So there's that O Positive Festival in Kingston, New York, is coming up. That's the seventh through the ninth of October, and community member Joe Conk in the ridership, he is the founder of that festival. And once again, we're going to be coordinating a gravel ride uh, together with a road ride and a, a mural tour ride, which will be through the, the city of Kingston and is very family friendly as part of that weekend. I believe it's going to be on the 8th. So we'll be posting more information about that in the ridership and would love to have people come out and join. That's super cool. I remember you talking about the festival last year and some of the riding that you've done with Joe up there. So that sounds awesome. So for anybody on the East Coast that's within range of that or able to travel. As Randall said, I'll definitely put some notes out there. Maybe we can talk about it again more specifically when you lock down the details. Yeah, we're we're finalizing the route right now and we'll create a page for the event. So if you're interested in staying in touch, we'll definitely announce it here on the pod. I might even bring Joe on for a few minutes to share some more details. But the festival itself, it's it's arts, it's music, it's community, it's great food and just a wonderful vibe right outside the Catskills. And the riding out there is great. I've done quite a bit of riding out there with him and others. So if you're in that area, definitely come out and join us. We'd love to see you. The, the event is, it'll be, the ride will be, you know, we may ask like a, for a recommended donation, which doesn't have to be provided. And that goes towards the artist community in Kingston. And then, you know, there'll also be an option to get a wristband for the entire festival too. So, uh, got it. So yeah. 
And if you want to be, participate in the conversation, definitely join the, uh, the Hudson Valley channel in the ridership. That's what, where we'll be talking about this. Cool. I similarly, I'm trying to get my act together because I signed up to support the Marin County Bike Coalition and the NorCal NICA League for the Adventure, Adventure Revival Ride. I think it started three, maybe four years ago. They did had one year that was virtual during the pandemic, but mm -hmm. I missed last year because it sold out. So I was sure to get on it this year. And it's a great route starting out of Fairfax, California. It's a super fun route, very technical. It's only 60 miles, but it's got a decent amount of climbing, particularly up the aptly named Randall Trail off of <laughs> Highway 1 is a, is a grind at the end. And then you're coming across Fairfax Bolinas Ridge, but it's a lot of fun. And I believe I saw that Rebecca Rush is joining us. Oh, on great. The 17th. So that's going to be cool. She's so nice. Former podcast guest. Couldn't have been more friendly when I've connected with her and subsequent times when I've run into her. It's been awesome. So looking forward to seeing her again. I got to meet her at a dinner hosted around Sea Otter some years back. And yeah, she's, she's a rad woman and a great rider. Very, very cool. Yeah. Is it the same route as the original? Because I did the original one some years back living in the Bay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't think they've changed anything. I mean, I'll tell you after the 17th, but I'd, I'm pretty sure it's the same route. All right. Well, if anyone's considering doing this, run higher volume tires and have a properly low gear because you will want both and maybe a suspension stem. And maybe a suspension fork, Randall. I'm just yeah, saying. maybe a suspension <laughs> fork. It's sacrilegious, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great route, and and totally perfect recommendations, Randall, because it's 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 technical. It'll push your limits. I mean, I loved it. I just thought it was like one of those routes that favored adventure. Like the yeah. name, the name is perfect because you're just out there on the mountain. They're carving the route through rugged terrain. You know basic fire roads and just, just an awesome part of the north side of Marin. I mean, it's the location where mountain biking got its start. And uh, frankly, the gravel bikes that we ride are far superior mountain bikes than they were riding back in those days. So yeah, a hundred percent. I think I recently was at the, at the, the museum up in Fairfax, the mountain bike museum and looking at a clunker. And I was just like, mm -hmm. I can't even imagine with a kickback break, how they even survived going down Mount Tam. Well, they had to rebuild those hubs pretty much every run <laughs> is my yeah. understanding. So and hence the name Repack Downhill. Exactly. Yeah. I've yeah. ridden with a few of the the OGs of the mountain biking scene and it, it wasn't the good old days. We definitely have it yeah. better now. Speak, speaking of which, we have a new bike to nerd about. Yeah. It's a good transition. Not, may not maybe a bike that I would take on Adventure Revival per se, but a very interesting bike for people to take a look at. It's the BMC... Now, how do we decide that it was say, pronounce it? Say it with confidence. Caius. It's got to be Caius. Okay, that's Maybe right. Maybe K-I-S. Caius. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. Super racy bike. Actually, what I would have thought that BMC would have introduced to begin with, kind of in the vein of the Cervelo Espero, mm. this bike looks, I mean, this bike could have been a road bike when when you see a picture of it. It's stunning. I love, they, there are some unique design elements on the top tube that are very BMC. I like how the, you know, the chains, the seat stays are perfectly parallel with the down tube. And it's just a very elegant bike. The, the paint schemes, particularly on that top end model, are quite striking and definitely a gravel race bike. And in fact, I would say a, a dedicated gravel race bike, which is a little bit different than that Aspero. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's seven dedicated 700C, but it still manages a fairly tight chain stay and fairly good tire clearance. I mean 700 by 45 is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, especially in such a, a you know a tight chain stay, and it's it's optimized for that. It has 80 mil of BB drop, which is to say like the bottom bracket drop relative of relative to the axles, and that's quite a bit. So anyone running longer cranks is going to have say like a pedal strike issue if they try to run smaller tires, which is why I say like, it's not quite like the Aspero. The Aspero is much more of a one bike, Like you could use it as a dedicated road bike as well. And it would be great for that. So it's like bikes like that or ours, or, you know, the, the open up that I always call out. So this is the, the bottom bracket drop, the fact that it's a, a longer top tube, so longer reach relative to the stack. Just make it a bike that is very much optimized for bigger 700C tires, shorter stems. I mean, all of this works really well, well off-road, but kind of takes away from its versatility as a, as a road bike, yeah. which, is, I also, which is fine for what it's designed for. Yeah. 
I mean, it's very intentional, right? I also saw that they spec like a fairly narrow handlebar on there with a wide flare. Mm -hmm. So they're like keeping, again, keeping that body tight in that race, race position. Yeah, which eh, I, I'm not sure how much I like that. I think it makes a ton of sense on the road, but I... I feel like often, well, well, we'll see. I think there's, I think there's a place for it. I would probably want, if I was going to go so narrow, I'd probably want to do a compound flare in order to get even more flare in the drops without having the hoods super kicked out because that, you know, that, that extra leverage in the drops is, is nice to have. And it's yeah. kind of, but you know, interesting to see some, some difference of perspective there. Yeah. Um, let me be clear. Like I would be terrified to ride I think it was a 37 millimeter bar hood to hood. I would be terrified to ride that. I mean, that just seems really tight. I have heard of some of the pros kind of going super narrow mm -hmm. and maybe on a, a non-technical course like a SPT gravel, or if you live in a part of the country where it's, you know, you're just basically on dirt roads mm -hmm. that might, that might work. But yeah, for me, I think I'd be terrified. I think that there's a, a place for this and you, you see it on, on the road. You've seen some road pros go towards more narrow up top and it does improve aero and there are a lot of gravel races are not that technical. And so that aero benefit is meaningful. I just think that there's a little bit more evolution to happen in terms of one, getting even more aero on those narrower hoods. So maybe like something to support the forearm a little bit so you can be grabbing the the top of the of the hoods but and, and have your your forearms perpendicular to the ground, uh, parallel to the ground and your upper arm perpendicular. So you really get that aero benefit. But then, you know, again, compound flare to get that, maintain that extra leverage in the drops when you need it. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're getting into deep handlebar nuance here. Let's, let's yeah, back out and sure. look at the rest of this machine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think it's, it's just sort of interesting, as you pointed out, like this is for a very specific rider and it's pretty natural that companies are going to continue to evolve around speed and ultra performance for one side of the market, not the side of the market that's going to attract me per se, but mm -hmm. as more and more dollars go into racing and more and more people are looking for super high performance, like it's natural that bike companies are going to do this type of thing. There's also an element of like, you know, the bike industry likes N plus one. And so this yeah. is distinct enough from a, a road bike where you would have your road bike and and this bike. And the type of person who has this bike probably has multiple bikes. I mean, it's a dedicated race bike. So that, yeah. you know, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you pointed out a few other th interesting things about the design as well. Yeah, so I like I like how they did the inter I'm not a huge fan of integrated cabling through handlebars and stems and I like how it seems that they kept the the cabling external to the handlebar and then ran it underneath that new rock shock that new shock stop stem. I think they're calling it some something different. They they built it in uh, using Redshift's suspension stem tech. And so it stays external until it drops into the upper headset bearing. Uh, so that okay. could be a lot worse in terms of serviceability and adjustability and so on. The top end model is a one piece handlebar and stem that has fully internal routing. Looks stunning. Looks really, really beautiful, but an absolute nightmare to set up and service. And I wouldn't recommend going that route on any sort of bike, period, because even a pro rider needs to be able to get their fit adjusted properly. Yeah. 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 I mean, you and I share the same opinion on like on elements of bike design that make it constrained from modification, easy modification. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you on that. It absolutely looks gorgeous, but knowing me, like, I think I'd be frustrated at the limitations of it. Yeah. Yeah. But kudos to them on the uh, keeping the, the cabling outside the bars on the uh, lower end models, which I say lower end, they start at six grand, which is another thing about this bike, which is on trend. Everything is so expensive. It's remarkable how expensive bikes are these days. Um, yeah. We got a, we got a question about that in the, in the ridership, right? Just sort of why are bikes so expensive? And it's, yeah, I don't know. You know, when you look at a $10,000 bike or $6,000 bike, it's just, that's, I mean, it's a hell of a lot of money. And there's, I think there's a few things that go into that. So this was, uh, we, we put out some, you know, we asked the, the ridership community for some questions and comments. So this was uh, Matthew Kramer chiming in, you know, asking about why bikes have gotten so expensive. I think a, a big part of it, I mean, of course there's inflation, right? And one of the major drivers of inflation in recent years are COVID related supply chain constraints, right? So it's harder to get, it's hard to get parts. 
and it's hard to get complete yep. bikes, which means there's, you know, uh, up until recently, the, and there was a flood of of like stimulus money, for example, into the market. So you had all these dollars chasing less available product. And so bike companies focused on the higher end. I mean, we did the same thing. We, we you know, we actually kind of regret having eliminated the mechanical model, because uh, but it was because we couldn't get parts and we went with yeah. all access, which is really great, but puts it at a a more premium point, but and then you're layering, you're layering in increased fuel costs for transportation. There's a lot of things that have gone into it. Yeah, that is a factor, but I, I don't think that that's a major driver for this. I think it's more, well, honestly, a, a significant part of it is people are paying it, right? And there's some R and D that goes in here, like the you know this some of these bikes that you see coming out um, on the really high end. You know the volumes are not that great, and so that R and D has to be incorporated somewhere. And with bike companies focusing on the higher end, because that's where the bigger margins and dollars are, and riders having limited options in the more affordable end of the market, because that's not where bike companies are focusing. I mean, I think it's it's kind of like the automotive industry right now, where you know, I bought I bought a used Prius for like seven grand, and I've put a bunch of miles into it, and like you know, like scrape the bumper and things like that, and I could probably sell it for eleven. Right. And like you, you just see that in a number of different domains. And I think the the, the bike space is no different. But yeah. you do get bikes are improving in incremental ways. But I, I it has been a pretty radical shift towards the top of the market. It's just hard to find middle end products that is frankly just as good in many yeah. ways. Yeah. 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 I mean, you hope over time we know historically it does trickle down. And there's, I mean, don't get us wrong. I mean, I think there's a lot of good entry level bikes out there. It's just getting your hands on one and finding one today is a challenge. When supply chains go from 30 to 60 day lead times to, you know, at one point, you know, there were like, you have very limited options for your levers and, and derailleurs and so on, right? We have a duopoly in our industry you know, and Campy is now, you know, they have a, a good product, a competitive product in gravel now with their 13 speed stuff, e-car groups. But, you know, that stuff was like one to two years. So when yeah. that's the case, you know, if you have a limited buy, where are you going to focus? You're going to focus on the higher end. And that's that I think that's part of it too. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also remember you mentioning on an earlier podcast just the amount of commitment level that component manufacturers are expecting from you. So, mm -hmm. you know, in order to get a, a seat at the table, maybe you have to buy 50 of something, which as a small builder, you know, that can that's a that's a lot of dollars out of pocket. Well, and the, the smaller builders generally are like if you're a domestic builder and you're assembling domestically, it's a different supply chain. You're paying you're paying more from say like SRAM for their domestic distributor versus the you know their Taiwan based distributor just because they're manufacturing a lot of that stuff in Taiwan. But yeah, there were greater constraints. Sometimes you had to put a deposit up front, and you know you put a deposit on something that is not going to you're not going to have for a year, and you can't get that deposit back. So the the risks associated with, you know, well, is something else new going to come out, or what's the market going to look like in a year? So there's there's all these, you know, it, it really drives home just rem how remarkable it was prior to the pandemic that supply chains worked so well. I mean, truly, it is a miracle of a whole lot of very complex decentralized coordination that you know any of this works at all as a supply chain nerd it's it's something that that is 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 not lost on me and yeah even the current circumstance it's still pretty amazing what humans do yeah all right so where do we want to go from here yeah i mean one thing i did did i thought was interesting that you pointed out about that bmc is that they do have an integrated suspension stem offering yep. from that they've worked with it sounds like redshift on yep yeah yeah i thought that was well executed one Downside, I believe, is that you can't flip the stem, and with that be bike being relatively long and and on the lower side, like a you know it's a race bike, you know it's again you have more constrained fitment options. I think the standard shock stop stem you can run in the up uh, upward pointing direction. Yeah, um, you can. Yeah, I think what's interesting to point out there though, so if this in BMC's designer's mind, this is a flat out thoroughbred race bike, mm -hmm. to have that be an option suggests that. Designers are coming around to the fact that suspension and suppleness can can be a performance benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Like put, putting, I mean, we, you and I have talked about that, and obviously, I'm sold on it. But it just struck me as like this incredibly aero, stretched out race bike is offering that. 
they must have determined that this is going to help people win races. Yeah. Yeah. Fatigue and control. It's material. Yeah. And they've also done a few things with the frame design, which you see on other bikes, like the really, the, the seat tube towards the bottom gets really narrow. Uh, gets really thin, so it has yeah. a lot more flex built in. You saw yeah. that with bikes like you know the GT Grade is is kind of an extreme example of that. Uh, but compliance is is a great thing. That's the reason why we have such, one of the reasons we have such wide rims now too. And what's so great about you know high volume supple tubeless tires, you know it, it all it all improves speed as a system. Yeah, I mentioned this when I had someone from BMC on talking about the Urs and the Urs LT. I have a I have a hardtail. BMC 29er mountain bike from back in the day, like at least a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting on that bike. I came off of a, a similar niner coming to that bike. The back end definitely had a suppleness to it. It had that, that exact drop stay design that you're kind of talking about. Mm -hmm. And it really worked. And I was super impressed. I remember when I got on that bike, it just felt so fast and I could control it so well. Yeah. Well, I had, you know, you, probably heard the conversation I had on the pod with Craig Kalf talking about suspension on road bikes and yeah. whether or not you fully agree with that thesis. I think it's, I think it's fairly compelling, definitely higher volume tires. Like I don't see even, even in Marin, I would be running minimum 28 mil tubeless tires at nice 100%. low pressures on wide rims. There's no reason to run narrower than that. And you see a lot of the new aero wheel options for road being built to a width where you can actually get an aero benefit with those tires, you know, adhering to the rule of 105%, which we had talked about in the wheel episode. So, so yeah, all of these things are, are good developments. Yeah. You know, speaking of good developments, I managed actually to hook up with Matt Harvey from Enduro Bearings. They did a ride out of Fairfax, California a few weeks back, and I, I joined probably 50 people up there. Yuri Hoswald, another podcast oh, wow. guest was on there and I think a couple others. I, th I think I counted four old podcast guests on that ride, which was great, but a hell of a lot of fun. You had some conversation, some great conversation with him about enduro bearings, which I hope people will go back and reference. But I think there was a question or a comment about from the ridership about that. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we covered in that episode, which I had so much fun with Matt, he's just has a wealth of knowledge about the bicycle industry. He's an engineer, an engineering mindset, clearly cares a lot about what he does. And, you know, talking about the merits or lack thereof of a lot of ceramic bearings. And long story short, most ceramic bearings are rubbish. The ones that are, of those that are good, the majority of them require a lot more maintenance to stay good. And the, and the benefit is pretty trivial. And then there's this XD15 bearing that Enduro makes. And I'm sure, you know, others probably have some, some equivalent, but I haven't looked into it. But that I find really interesting, and this is an aero, you know, I think a French aerospace alloy used for, steel alloy used for the races, and then they have these high, very high grade ceramic balls, and because of this particular steel, which is very expensive, and they have to buy it, they they can't buy it in tube form. They have to you know buy it in sheets and and take it from there, I believe. But because of the unique properties of this material, you can get you can use ceramic bearings. And if it gets any contamination, essentially the contamination gets like pulverized and kicked out as opposed to pitting and, and starting to, to damage the, the metal. Because in many cases of ceramic bearings, that metal is a lot less hard than the bearing itself. And thus, as a consequence, it's the thing to give. We go into a lot more detail in that episode. But yeah, Hans, I'm going to, I might butcher this. So bear with me here. Lelelid, I'm guessing, L-E-L-L-E-L-I-D. He, he brought up this article that James Huang, who I admire immensely, he's at Cycling Tips now, wrote about an enduro bottom bracket with this XD15 bearing set. And what James said was, incredibly low friction feel, phenomenal toughness. We did everything we could to kill it, but this thing is simply incredible. And like that is coming from someone like James Huang. It makes me really think, okay, this is something that we're going to still do a little bit more investigation and Matt's going to be sending us some data, but we'll probably, we're strongly considering this in, incorporating these into a, a higher end version of our the Logos wheels in the future. Got it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had enough smart people tell me that that was the way to go and happy that I've got that in my bottom bracket of my my unicorn that I've started riding. Oh, it's an XD15? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, yeah. sweet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, genuine benefits that you don't have to spend a lot of time servicing. In fact, the service, in, it should essentially be zero service. That's pretty that's, cool. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, not cheap though, not cheap. Yeah, so everyone else, cheap. high quality steel bearings. Yeah. And I think Hans was also leading the conversation around just kind of like flared bars, flat pedals, different kinds of like, you know, we're just out there for enjoying the ride kind of features of a bike or ways in which you could set up a bike. Yeah. I mean, I think flared bars are de rigueur. I would run flared bars on every drop bar bike, including a pure road performance bike, just with it, maybe a different philosophy on my road bike. I'd go super narrow and get the flares to have more control in the drops, yeah. aerodynamics, but flare is here to stay. You see levers being designed with a little bit of flare. So with flare in mind and, you know, any sort of, you know, is there an aero cost? I have no idea. I, I don't think so. As long as the lever is aligned with the bar behind it, it should sit in its wake. But if even if there was, the control benefits more than outweigh it. Yeah, I think that co- that the arrow part might come into play on the trend towards super wide bars. And as yeah. as you know, I've played around with that. I mean, I've got I think a a forty eight on one of my bikes, and my fitter kind of brought me back to a forty four. Mm. I I do miss kind of the off-road control, the way to rip the bike around that I got out of the wider bars, but I'm, I'm fairly comfortable at 44 as well. So I I think I just need to play around with the flare on the bar that I'm running right now. And then it will be the right, right mix for me. Well, we've talked about in the, the, in the ridership that we're thinking about developing a bar that has a compound flare. So you can get, say, like eight degrees on the hoods and then 16 to 20 in the drops. So you kind of get the best of both worlds in that you still get that, you know, that roadie fit up top, but then the extra control. The The first bar to do this, I believe, was the 3T Aero Gia, and, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. We've talked about yeah. it on the pod before. Yeah. And, and I uh, think there was the other one that was like the whisk, whiskey components has something similar. That also does a compound. Yeah. yeah. I think compound flare makes a ton of sense for, yeah. for all of these bikes. Um, I wish it wasn't so costly and you, you didn't have to sort of go all in to create a bar like because you can't 3D print something like this, right? No, but it, it would be easy enough for somebody to create, say, a, a high quality aluminum version. It's just a, another bending process plus a testing regime to yeah. make sure that it, yeah. you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't break on you. Yeah. I'm going to keep exploring that. I'm, I'm not sort of locked and loaded on my handlebar and stem right now. Still just wanted to make sure that the bike was fitting me correctly. And I feel like I've got enough inputs to figure out which way I want to go with any one of the cockpit components. Well, depending on your, what your time frame is, I may have a prototype for you in time. So let's, uh, let's right. keep talking. Many, many reasons why you're a good friend. Right? <laughs> just one of them. You know, a guy, you know, a guy who can yeah. get you stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Tom Shield frequent- was asking yeah. about suspension seat posts. What's your take here? I, I'm a yes. So, I mean, I've been running on the thesis. I have a, a, a PNW Coast dropper yep. that has both a drop and a suspension. And I found that it's air tuned. So, very tunable, very predictable. And I came to the conclusion like, anytime it moved, when my first inclination was like, oh crap, I'm losing performance. Anytime it moved, I wasn't in a fluid pedal stroke. Like I had hit something unexpectedly and it was just saving me. Mm -hmm. And similarly, although I think it's less active, RockShock on the wireless, their wireless dropper post does have what they call active ride. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably not tuned correctly on it right now because I don't feel a lot of movement. The big difference between the two is on the P- PWC, PMC, what am I saying? PNC, Pacific, Pacific Northwest. PNC, yes. <laughs> that one moves when you're fully extended. So it doesn't matter whether you're dropped or not, like it, it'll move if the amount of pressure applied to it from your, your backside is is forcing it to move. Yeah. Whereas the RockShock post, it has to be lowered a little bit. So if you're in the full position, oh. you're wholly locked out. It's only active when you're down a little bit. I wonder if that's a design constraint because meaning something inherent in how they architected it as a dropper post, because yeah. from a product standpoint, that's exactly the opposite of what I would want. I'm kind of with you. And, and I, you know, in talking to RockShock, 
they did say some of their riders will actually set it up a little bit high yeah. so that they can basically constantly ride it with it on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense, especially adjustability. So to, to answer Tom's question, I think we both agree that suspension has its merits. I would definitely get a dropper first though. I like the best suspension you have is your arms and legs and the, the float between your body and the bike. That's, that's my strong opinion. And from there you have pneumatic suspension from the tires. You can do, you know, uh, a slightly cushier saddle, like, you, you know, you, you can have some, some compliance in the frame. There's a whole bunch of things you do before you do a suspension seat post primary amongst those being a dropper. Yeah. hundred percent dropper. Number one upgrade. Get a dropper bikes. <laughs> You'll never go. I don't know if I've ever met anybody who went back, honestly, once they had a dropper. Yeah. I mean, I occasionally talk to people looking at our bikes who are like, oh, well, you know, can I swap in a rigid post? And I was like, well, if that's what you want to do, get the, you know, the Axis wireless droppers are really expensive and they're heavy, but you could have a saddle on one of those and, and yeah. you know, a standard post and swap it in, in and out with a single yeah. bolt. So that, that's an option. I've got that set up now. And I will tell, I will tell you, I will tell our friends in the community if I ever swap it. Yeah. 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 I don't think, I don't think I will, but (laughs) I could see on a city bike or like a burning man rig, not having a dropper. That's about (laughs) it. (laughs) That's a, that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. I will argue with you on the city bike, but anyway, yeah, (laughs) you still want a dropper on the city bike. (laughs) Let's see. Luke Lopez and Larry Rose were commenting about non-competitive gravel setups, you know, alternative handlebars, flat pedals, bags, and fun rides, and so on, inspired by our friends over at Pathless Pedaled, who very much do a lot to create content around the non-competitive side of cycling. So yeah. what are your thoughts? There? Yeah. I mean, I think whether or not you set your bike up in a specific way to go out and have this non-competitive experience, or it's just a mindset, I think we're aligned in that gravel. Gravel is for everyone, right? And whatever your jam is, going fast, going slow, just getting out there is important. I mean, for me, I often change my clothing mm-hmm. when I'm out there for just a fun ride. Like, Like I've got some some, you know, great baggies that I can wear and different things. And it's definitely a different mindset rolling out the door. Not that I'm out there hammering on a general basis, but it's definitely a different mindset when I'm just out there to stop and smell the roses. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that mindset, but I still vastly prefer Lycra <laughs> and, and being clipped in and, and, you know, and so on. And I've got a, I've got a mountain bike. So like, having a flat bar on a gravel bike. Like I, I've had that set up on an old cross bike. I loved it. Super fun, nimble. But for me, like if I'm going to go flat bar right now, it's definitely going to be more on a mountain bike than a, a traditional gravel bike setup. Yeah. But at the same time you see, I, I can't recall if it was Luke, but you see folks uh, with like an old Bridgestone uh, mountain bike that they've converted into a, you know, yeah. a flat bar or a drop bar gravel bike. And it's, you know, they got a, you know, a handlebar bag on there and it's much more of like a, let's go out and get lost and have an adventure, maybe do coffee outside or things like this. Party pace as, you know, as Russ likes to say over at, you know, PLP. Yeah. If you've got a quiver by all means, I, I love all bikes and I'm one who appreciates the nuances between them. So, you know, I just don't have a garage big enough for all these things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like, I like the. I like being able in the middle of a ride to decide that I feel like throwing down a little bit. Sometimes I get that, that little jolt of energy less now that I'm 40, I suppose, but, but still happens. Yeah, I, I, I've seen you have those jolts. <laughs> I know it's there. Let's see what else. Oh, Matthew Kramer turned me on to something that I thought was really cool in the ridership, which was E13 now has a 12 speed 945 cassette that is compatible with standard 12 speed chains. So you don't need that funky flat top chain. That's fair, still, you know, pretty proprietary to SRAM in order to run a tighter cluster. So is that is that 12 speed cassette from SRAM something you have to run on their product? Um, so the way that SRAM has set it up, they have migrated all their road and then now their dedicated gravel drivetrains to this 12 speed flat top chain, which is, you know, it, it has a slight benefit in terms of like you, you get the same cross sectional area of the side plates with a thinner side plate. So they can make the chain a little bit thinner and that helps with the, the already very tight spacing of those cogs and the like, but also makes it so that it's something proprietary. 
And so they've been expanding that. I, I suspect that you'll see it on their mountain bike groups soon enough. And, you know, I really like to adopt, you know, proven open standards and non-proprietary stuff whenever possible. And the fact is that standard 12 speed works really well and nobody was making a tighter cluster for Eagle, like, you know, or, or for, for like, a, you know, a mullet setup where you have a mountain bike rear derailleur, but maybe you want a little bit tighter cluster, a little bit tighter cassette for your road or your, your certain gravel applications. When you talk about tighter cassette, I remember seeing this pop up and I was like, 945, okay, why do I really care? We talk about the tighter cluster, because I think that's mm-hmm. an important maybe nuance beyond just like, oh, you got a 45 and a nine. Yeah, so the, the biggest knock that people have against one by drivetrains is the jumps between cogs, right? And yeah, I get it. A lot of this can be mitigated by proportional crank length and by having a proper bike fit because it allows you to spin at a wider range of cadences without, you know, while still maintaining a smooth pedal stroke. And I've, I've been fine with my setups. This 945 is, it's the same as a, a 10 speed 1138, which is, you know, a, a larger road cassette from, from a few years ago. It just adds a a taller cog and a bigger cog, you know, on that same cassette. And so you get, you know, jumps that I think are probably tight enough for the vast majority of roadies to say like, okay, well, if I had any concerns about jumps, now those are mitigated. Some people want it to be like one tooth jumps between cogs and, you know, okay, go ride your road bike. That that's fine. But, but yeah, I like, I like to see this. I was actually considering having us develop something if someone else didn't. So I'm glad to see this in the market. I think there's a real gap for it. Yeah. It's interesting. I wonder why like SRAM doesn't go to a nine. Cause uh, you think like, I understand why smaller companies kind of pop up and they see an opportunity like this gap, but E13 has been doing this kind of thing for a while. The nine tooth is, so it, it's going to wear all else equal, same material and everything, it's going to wear itself and the chain more quickly than a 10 tooth or an 11 tooth, right? And so the, the entire philosophy of the drivetrain changes with a nine tooth in that, you know, I like to think of the nine tooth as an overdrive gear. Plus the jump between the nine and the 11 is significant, right? So if you're spending a lot of time at the top end of the range, you know, you might not love that. But for me, you pair it with a 42 chain ring and that 42 nine with a, you know, a, a 700 by 28 or 700 by 30 tire is the equivalent of a, of a road bike with, you know, 5111, which is to say you have plenty of top end. You're not going to spin out all the time on, on a high speed descent, but it's not all that often that I'm descending at those sorts of speeds. And so that jump from the 11 to the nine is not a problem for me on that end of the cassette. And so in turn, when you have that nine tooth, that also informs the chain ring that you pair with it. Right, because you you know you you kind of need to set your chain ring based on how you want to calibrate that range that the cassette has. So yeah, I'm not surprised that SRAM didn't go that didn't go that route, but I do think it makes a ton of sense. And I love one by drivetrains, and I'm all about one bikes as well with one by drivetrains. And so the nine tooth really facilitates that. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. And Eli Bingham, who often chimes in in the ridership about some real technical stuff and tends to explore a lot of components, he had a kind of note on this, didn't he? Yeah. So one thing you got to make sure because of, and again, this gets into like proprietary standards and so on. So like the free hub, the XD, XDR free hub standard that this cassette is compatible with is a proprietary standard that, you know, SRAM made it. So any, it's really easy for a wheel company to create a wheel with a free hub that that uses the you know XD XDR, but they patented every possible way they could think of of attaching a cassette to that, so that only they could produce the cassettes. And so E13 has a came up with a really clever solution, but it requires like a cinch bolt that clamps around the free hub body, and if that comes loose, that it can affect the shifting. So that's kind of like the one issue that these can have. I've never had that issue with E13 cassettes, and I've run them exclusively for several years now. But it's just something to keep in mind. I find that they ship, shift uh, really excellent, and they're light, and they hold up well because they're you know most of the cogs are steel. Right. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. And then I think we should end with I think which, which was one of my favorite questions coming out of the ridership from our friend Silas Patlove. Is the pursuit of a quiet bike without creeks an achievable goal or a pipe dream? It depends on what you're starting with, unfortunately. I think in general, I mean, this should af- absolutely be the standard. It, there's no reason why things should be rattling around. And, you know, there are ways to get around it. So there, you know, 
wireless shifting and so on helps, but also like in our case, we run full housing through the frame and then we put it in a, we put it in a foam sleeve and we do that with the hydraulic hoses too. And every bike company should be doing that because rattles suck. Bottom bracket creak again, like any bottom bracket will creak if it gets contaminated, but you know, having a bottom bracket set up that aligns and supports the bearings sufficiently, you know, should eliminate the vast majority of those creaks. Yeah. It, this, this should entirely be possible. Unfortunately, there are a lot of bikes that, mm, let's just say that this sort of thing was an afterthought. So it may cost, yeah. it may cost some money and require some expertise to chase out the, you know, all those creaks. I think that's gotta be the worst task as a bike mechanic to be tasked with is when someone comes in and says, my, my bike is creaking, help me resolve it. Yeah. And, and honestly, my experience, it, it's a special mechanic who's, who's really good at it. Um, I've had bikes yeah. that, you know, our, our bikes will have a creak here and there and we'll say like, you know, s- s- bring it to a mechanic, have them, uh, take a look and they can't chase it. And I've actually had an instance where I had the bike shipped to me personally and I chased it, but I chased it in a way that like, you know, it's, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, it wasn't even a creak. It was just that the axis rear derailleur, the hanger on the, was ever so slightly misaligned. And then the axis derailleur was harder when it's miscalibrated. It makes a lot of noise on the cassette. And that was the noise. And so we're like, they were looking at the bottom bracket. They were looking at the seat post. They're looking at the, the headset interface and, and so on. And unless you have that, like the time and that deductive mindset and some experience of like what things sound like, it's really hard to, to chase. So if you have a mechanic who's a good chaser, that that's, that's someone who really knows their stuff and cares. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I might, might go to, I mean, as a non methodical bad mechanic, definitely like I clean my bike when a Creek arrives and that usually like it's a 85% of the time mm-hmm. solves the problem. Yep. And then if, if I need to go further, it's about, you know, greasing things, making sure just kind of really being a little more inspective of, of what's going on. Yeah. I've, I've generally been pretty lucky that I haven't had creeks that I weren't, that I wasn't clear on how to resolve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to end with a, with something that I'm excited about, which is I haven't nailed it down yet, but I had pinged you about coming out West for a bit. And so once those dates are locked down, you know, getting a big group ride in the Bay Area and potentially in a couple other parts of the U.S., uh, something I'm super excited about and to meet some of the riders that are in the forum and that are our regular listeners and so on. So more on that as we approach, but that would probably be Denver, Boulder, maybe San Diego, and then definitely the Bay Area. That's super exciting. I feel like, you know, before the pandemic, we had kicked off some really amazing group rides. Yeah. And I miss it. I know you. Yeah. I and you and I have been longing for it. We've had a lot going on to not kind of be putting that out there ourselves personally, but I think it's, it's a great time to do that. And hopefully we can get some knocked out by the end of the year and super excited to see you when you're in the Bay area. Likewise. It's been too long. Yeah. Well, good to catch up my friend. Likewise. All right, my friend. Take care. Take care. See ya. That's going to do it for this week's edition of In the Dirt from the Gravel Ride podcast. As a bit of a postscript, I did attend the Adventure Revival ride up in Marin County out of Fairfax this past weekend. Quite a lovely event benefiting NICA. The course is amazing and difficult, as I imagined and remembered from the last time I did it. Such a great route put together by the Marin County Bike Coalition. Super challenging. On a gravel bike, I remember thinking about halfway through, wow, I'm about halfway through, feeling quite beat up, and I was riding my unicorn with a front suspension fork on it. I certainly saw a number of riders out there on mountain bikes, which would not have been a bad choice. Anyway, phenomenal event, definitely something to have on your radar down the line. If you're interested in connecting with myself or Randall, please join The Ridership. Simply visit www.theridership.com. That's a free online global cycling community where you can connect and discuss gravel cycling with athletes from all over the world. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, please visit buymeacoffee.com slash thegravelride. And remember, ratings and reviews are always hugely appreciated. Until next time... Here's to finding some dirt under your wheels.